Good morning. There you are. First things first, happy Mother's Day. Thank you, moms. My name is Max Muchnick. I am the class of 1987, but I prefer to be called the Max. In Los Angeles, I'm simply known as a dangerously handsome television writer. But in Boston, I'm just an overpriced cafeteria on the second floor of a dormitory. I guess it keeps me real. I am so thrilled to be here today, receiving a doctorate of human letters in this company is truly awesome. I don't think I can adequately express the meaning and significance that this degree will have on me and my family. This week, my mother will finally be able to sit down at the beauty parlor and tell Susie Schmertz that her son is also a nice Jewish doctor. Thank you. Thank you. I, I forgot to ask. I hope I get a prescription pad with this doctorate. Um, another thing that will make my mother very happy. Um, but enough about my family. There's more to come on my same-sex, almost legal husband and our twin daughters born via gesta gestational surrogacy in a section of the speech I call Gabies and Schmarriage. A gay man can have it all-ish in 2013. I first want to acknowledge the Board of Trustees and our esteemed Chairman, Jeff Greenhut. Thank you for having me here today. I have proudly served on this board for eight years, and I wear it like a badge of honor. But the real reason I'm here today is because of Emerson's president, Lee Pelton. What an exemplary leader you have been for this college, particularly this year particularly in the minutes and days following the horrific incident that took place in our front yard on Patriot's Day. I was in my office on the Warner Brothers lot in Los Angeles when I was told about the bombing on Boylston Street. My first thought was for my family and for Emerson. My nephew is an Emersonian. When I reached Mason, he told me that he was all right, but that some of the students had been injured and that President Pelton was at the hospital with them. It's Lee's caring nature and quick response to take action that tells us everything we need to know. Simply put, this is a man of impeccable character. As a trustee of this college, as a member of the community, and as a, as a representative of these parents this morning, we're glad you were the guy in charge on April 15th. Keep calm and pelt on. Okay, thank yous out of the way. Now on to what you Emersonians really care about, yourselves. <laughs> you all have been very patient. I've talked about other stuff for almost three pages. But now it's time to dive into a big pool of you. <laughs> but again, I have to express more thanks because it's not just President Pelton and the remarkable faculty at Emerson that get all the credit for the handling of the events surrounding the marathon. It's you too. It's the kick-ass class of 2013. As a student body, you rallied immediately. Moments after the blast, you kicked into high gear. You took to the streets armed with cameras and journalistic know-how. In the days following, you were online, checking in with one another, donating blood, and in true Emerson fashion, you found a way to use communication and marketing to raise money for the victims. Yeah. 
I don't know if the parents in this room know, but it was the Emerson students who first uh, were the first to create the wildly successful Boston Strong T-shirts. As of this week, Emerson Strong, the Emerson Strong campaign, has raised over $800,000. What vision. Emerson students used a skill set they most likely learned in this college to help start the healing process in this city. It's so uniquely Emerson. Boston strong. It's a powerful phrase. The idea that the citizens of this city are fused with a unique strength that comes from a shared sense of a special place. It got me thinking. The students at this school were able to create Boston Strong because they are Emerson Strong. You are Emerson Strong. I am talking to all of you, whether you are leaving today with a degree in film or theater, or journalism or communication disorders. Every single one of you is Emerson Strong. Now, I don't know how this school does it, or if we show up this way. It doesn't really matter because we always find each other. It's this thing that we have. I initially found Emerson because my guidance counselor at high school, Mr. Carlin, called me into his office and said, Muchnick, I want you to take a look at this school in Boston. I asked him why he thought it would be good for me. He told me that the students at Emerson marched to the beat of a different drummer. <laughs> I always thought that was just code for it's cool to be gay there. <laughs> but really, it's code for something else. I belonged at Emerson because I am Emerson Strong. It's our, it's your magic ingredient, your special sauce. I've been in Boston a lot this year, and I've been lucky to meet and talk with many of you. So hear this. You are the best of the best. You are the best of the best. And it gets scary after graduation, so you must always come back to this simple truth. You're good at what you do. Boston strong, Emerson strong. Today. I think it's my job to help you never forget about your special sauce. So how do you hold on to everything you've cultivated for the past four years? Friends of mine have an eight-year-old son and just recently gave birth to a little girl. When the mother asked her son days before she was to give birth if he was excited to meet his sister, he said yes, but he had a condition. He insisted that the only way he would welcome his baby sister into his life was if he got to meet her alone. He didn't want anyone else in the room. His parents struggled with this, but ultimately decided that it would be OK. They had a baby monitor in the nursery, so they could listen in, and if anything went wrong, they could sweep in. So the first night the baby girl was in the house and comfortably cooing in her crib, it was time for her to meet her big brother. The parents opened the door to the nursery, and they let their eight-year-old son into the room. When the door closed, mom and dad rushed to the kitchen to listen to the baby monitor. They heard their son cross the room. The crib creaked as he pushed his face between the slats. For a moment or two, he listened to the sounds of his infant si sister and then whispered a simple question to, his, to the newborn child. Tell me about God because I'm forgetting. Now, I love this story. And I don't care if you believe in God or not, you can pray to a giant peach for all I care. <laughs> that story has always touched me because it's about not forgetting who we really are. We are the eight-year-old child, and God is our identity. It's our character. And character, ladies and gentlemen, is all we really have. We are born, we are perfectly untouched and pure, no pretense, completely authentic. You don't have what I call the what-will-they-think-of-me syndrome. But here you are now, 20 years later, draped in all this knowledge. You have belief systems and relationships. You have a cultural identity. So how can you remain authentic while you're busy trying to be a brand? First and foremost, stop being a brand. <laughs> Ketchup is a brand. Preparation H is a brand. 
it really gets in the way of being a person. How do we make sure we don't forget who we are on the way to who we want to be? We tell the truth. One of the best parts about coming out for me was that by telling the truth, I no longer had to remember anything. There's a lot of detail work in lying. Once I stopped, I was free. Life gets so much easier when you're telling the truth. I was physically uncomfortable the entire time I was in the closet. Listen to this. For an entire year of my adolescence, I would go to bed at nighttime with popsicle sticks taped to my wrists because I, did, I was petrified that if I had limp wrists at school, it would give me away. For some reason, I had no problem with the satin baseball hat and rainbow suspenders, but the limp wrists <laughs> would be a dead giveaway. I started telling the truth in Boston. I really feel like I became the man I am today at this school because it was here that I no longer felt judged. My shrink reminds me every week that the practice of being human does not require criticism or judgment. That includes self-inflicted self criticism and judgment. In many ways, that's the worst of them all, right? When you walk out of here today, I urge you to keep that in mind. Trust yourself. Trust your instincts. Trust that you have the answers. What was worse than when you were in class and a professor asked a question that you had the answer to and you didn't raise your hand because you didn't trust yourself, so some chump two rows over answered for you <laughs> and he got all the glory. Be loud and proud about what you know. If you're not careful, allowing other people to speak for you can become a reflex. I gotta take a sip for this one. In the New Testament, my least favorite testament. <laughs> In the Sermon from the Mount, it is said, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works. Now, I wish that was a Nicki Minaj quote, but it's Jesus Christ. <laughs> And it makes my point about letting light shine much better than boom, ba -dum, boom, 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 boom. <laughs> that was such a risk, but I, you know, I went for it because I know you kids. I know you like the Nicki Minaj. <laughs> Will and Grace only came to me and my writing partner David Cohan because we weren't hiding our light under a basket. We were going to tell the story, we were going to tell that story before anyone else did. We would never have been able to write 200 episodes of that television show if we were worried about perception and judgment. It was only when we let go of that fear and told the truth that the stories we wanted to share were able to come forth. Not trusting yourself clogs up the pipes. You can't even ask good questions if you're not you or write good speeches. In preparing for today, I felt an enormous responsibility to connect with all of you. I, w I so badly wanted to get it right. I studied all these different commencement speeches online. Tom Hanks at Yale, Oprah at Spelman, Steve Jobs at Stanford. They gave great speeches. I wanted to be them, but every time I sat down to write this great speech, nothing would happen. It was only when I stopped being an Oscar-winning black talk show host who created the iPhone. <laughs> started being a gay Jew sitcom writer who created twin daughters, that authenticity gave way to creativity and words started to issue forth. And you know, guys, being authentic doesn't mean you have to stay the same. Transformation is key. When I got to Emerson, my name was Jason Muchnick. When I left, my name was Max Muchnick. And as of this morning, I am officially Dr. The Max. <laughs> You could still call me the Max, though. <laughs> you are about to be catapulted into real life. Embracing transformation will ultimately help you through the inevitable hard times, and there will be hard times. Despite all this great preparation and education, life will get its hooks in you. Demands, goals, students' loans, responsibilities, they can all be daunting. Even for the lucky of us, no one goes untouched. 
we were reminded on Marathon Monday that our normal can change in an instant. That is why it is so critical to roll with the punches and not limit yourself to one way of thinking or being. You don't lose your identity because you walk in someone else's shoes. You just develop compassion. So be kind. Not everyone has your special ingredient. Remember that empathy is the first step in making a positive connection. You've seen what harnessing your talents and compassion can do for a community and for your city. Now as you embark on post-grad life, you must use all of these qualities to harness, excuse me, you must lose, use all these qualities to make the world a better place. There's a Hebrew phrase, tikkun olam, it means to heal the world. A small act of kindness can snowball and maybe even start a revolution. Emerson Strong got us Boston strong. Now I'm running out of time and there are still so many things that I want to discuss, but I can't fit them into the body of the speech. So in no particular order, the following are the other very important things I want you to know. <laughs> Red vines are better than Twizzlers. <laughs> vote. Please vote. <clears throat> 310-659-5101. That's Dr. Tadoff's office in Beverly Hills. It's a tattoo removal place. <laughs> You'll want to get your tattoos removed. Nicole Richie and I learned this the hard way. <laughs> Take care of your shit. You can only have the freedom to be authentic when you've paid your bills. Buy a clean white shirt. Wearing a clean white shirt to an interview doesn't make you inauthentic. It makes you hireable, which helps you take care of your shit. <laughs> don't wear cheap shoes. Just in general, don't be cheap. But especially when it comes to footwear. Am I right, Debbie Allen? <laughs> She knows. She knows about footwear. <laughs> Reality TV is junk food. Make no mistake about it. You'll get fat if you watch this stuff. <laughs> American Idol. American Idol and fashion queens are the exceptions. <laughs> Mashed cauliflower is a great low caloric alternative to mashed potatoes. Make your bed every day. You think it's silly, but it's not. Make your bed. <laughs> Love is not a pie. You get more than six slices. Give it away freely, my friends. Your body is a pie. Do not give slices of it away freely. When you get a chance to meet a famous person, it is often very disappointing. Remember this when you become a famous person. <laughs> if you're in a fight with anyone in your immediate family, make up with them, even if it's not your fault. Two more, yes, make up today. I'm sure you've pissed off somebody. <laughs> Two more and probably what I believe it to be the most crucial. It's more important to be interested than interesting. I repeat, it's more important to be interested than interesting. And finally, listen carefully. Do not sleep with people in business class. <laughs> Only coach in first class. The confident and the grateful tend to be better lovers. Okay. We're almost done. Um, as I take a final moment of reflection, I can't help but look at your faces. You are all beautiful. I am so proud and grateful to know that you are about to charge into the world 
with a world-class education that will allow you to leave a mark in amazing and important ways. My husband, Eric, who is here with me this morning, and I want to thank you in advance for making the world a better place for our daughters. And finally, I want you to never forget, it was you who lovingly helped this city with Boston Strong because you are Emerson Strong, so now it is time to graduate strong. This is your time. There's room for you wherever you go. You get to write your history. You get to tweet your history. Just make it count. Let your light shine for all of us to see. Takun olam. God, good luck. I love you. God bless you.